My name is Stephen Quake. I'm a professor of bioengineering and applied physics at Stanford University. My work has been at the intersection of physics and biology for many years, and I have been part of developing technologies to create cell atlases, where we have molecular definitions of all the cell types in the human body, as well as many other organisms. And I've also been well known for my work developing novel clinical diagnostics, which are known as liquid biopsies. Well, let's start with this because this is interesting. I, I read about you that your, your background is uh, uh, math mathematics, you have a PhD in theoretical physics, but your, your career pathway is, is uh, sort of like in biology and biomedicine. Uh, how come? <laughs> Well, I started in physics, um, which is what I studied and which I loved, and I got interested in the interface of physics and biology, um, and I decided to try to bring the philosophy of measurement from physics into biology. Um, physicists have, a, have it as a defined field, they call it precision measurement. There was no such thing in biology, uh, and I decided to try to do that. And so, as I thought about different measurement approaches in biology, whether it's single molecule biophysics or microfluidic automation, to make single cell analysis or sequencing, doing single molecule sequencing. Um, these just opened up avenues to ask all kinds of interesting questions, um, which has uh, helped me, you know, sort of uh, explore things from very basic science to very clinically applied questions. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, uh, a lot of people might not, might not know this, but you, you developed the first, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, of course, the first nine invasive. Uh, test for Down syndrome? I did. Uh, how, that, how did that come about? Well, I got interested in it as a research problem when I became a parent myself. Um, and as my wife and I were expecting our first baby, uh, the doctor said, you should probably get amniocentesis. And uh, he did it. And it was terrifying, a giant needle right into her belly. And, you know, you're risking the life of the baby to ask a diagnostic question. And I thought, that's just ridiculous. Why would anybody use that as, as, a, as an approach. And that got me thinking about it as an important problem to work on. And uh, this solution presented itself to me several years later, where I ran across this phenomenon of circulating cell-free DNA, which had been known since the late 1940s, but it not something in the textbooks or widely appreciated. Uh, it turns out all of our tissues contribute DNA into the blood. Uh, when cells die, uh, the contents get thrown into the blood, the genome gets chewed up into little pieces, and the DNA circulates. And that's true, um, including if you're pregnant, some of that comes from the placenta and from the fetus. Um, and that provided the sort of uh, insight uh, to uh, develop a measurement method that allowed us to study the genetics of the fetus. Right, and, and this test is uh, now uh, in... in it's routine, or is, is it still in trials? Or is it... It's in very widespread usage. Um, upwards of 10 million women a year get some version of the test, and the use of amniocentesis has plunged dramatically, wow, which is be, great. You must be very proud of this. Very proud, yeah. Very proud. Mm, uh, speaking of it, you, you mentioned uh, your, your work with DNA and genomes, and I just read earlier that you're the fifth person in the world that had their genome sequence. Is that true? Yes. Wow. Um, so, like, the, the whole, this was years ago, must have been, right? Or, yeah, I think we published it in 2008. And so mm -hmm. I had been interested in developing novel sequencing methods, in particular ways to do sequencing of single molecules of DNA. Mm -hmm. We published that as an academic paper, uh, just sort of a proof of principle. And then I helped found a company that built commercial devices that became the fastest, cheapest, state-of-the-art sequencers in the world. And people didn't believe it was going to work. We were having trouble getting people to pay for the instruments. Mm -hmm. And so I took one and sequenced my genome on it to prove it could be done. And uh, at the time, it was not only the cheapest genome by an order of magnitude, it was also lowest manpower. Instead of 100 people on that paper, we had three authors. Um, one machine instead of a warehouse full of machines. And it really kind of broke through this wall of cost, effort, throughput, um, and made genome sequencing possible, something that any lab could do, and not something you needed a giant center for. Mm -hmm. We are speaking of which. Uh, I think the the Human Genome Project, over its lifetime, uh, the running costs were close to three billion dollars. Yes, yes, and we're now to the point where it costs how much? About a hundred dollars. Yeah, a few hundred dollars. Yeah, 
That's been the relentless advance of technology. There's been enormous innovation in the field over the last two decades. That's, that's amazing. Um, but closer to, to home and, and nowadays, um, you're the co-author of a recent paper that came out, I think, in December last year, um, about <clears throat> the idea, this idea of building a virtual cell using AI. C can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, AI is transforming science. What is done for protein structure and protein design has been revolutionary. And uh, I believe it'll be also useful for much more difficult and complex problems like understanding cell biology. And we organized a workshop at CZI where we brought together uh, many luminaries in uh, biology and in computer science and also some skeptics. And we had a day of discussion. Would it be possible to create a virtual cell? And if so, what should the expectation be and what would the timeline be? And from that emerged the paper that we collectively published. There was like two dozen authors on the paper um, that laid out a vision for the field of what might happen over the next decade. Uh, and it's been sort of gratifying to see the response. It really has struck a chord in the community. And uh, there's now a lot of energy around using AI to understand cell biology. Mm -hmm. But when we uh, refer to a virtual cell, which type of cell? There are like uh, 500 different types of cells in the human body? So, <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good question. If you look in the textbooks, they'll say there's three or 400 different cell types. But we've been embarked for the last decade on a project to try to really uh, study and measure every cell type in the human body. And there's at least an order of magnitude more than that. Um, and so we've experimentally characterized, this has been the point of our Tabula Sapiens project we did at the Biohub uh, as a large team science project. Uh, and uh, it's much more complex than people anticipated. Uh, there's no way to predict the cell types from the genome. And so we had to go do it experimentally. And all that data is providing the foundation for new large language models uh, that we believe will help us understand cell types, not just in the human body, but in every other organism. Right. So, um, once, let's say, uh, you, you, you nail it down, you know, building that virtual cell, what's the ultimate goal? Is it building a, a digital twin? You know, I would say, I mean, many people are interested in that, yes. I would say, uh, for me, I look at cell biology now, and the field is 90% experimental, 10% computational. I think virtual cell models will be a tool that will invert that ratio and let you get 90% of the way there to a question you're interested in with computation mm -hmm. and needing experiment just to get the last 10% of the way there. Mm -hmm. So it will make experimentalists incredibly more efficient in what they do. You're excited about this? I'm very excited, yeah. So what, what are you working uh, on nowadays? Well, I mean, we've been trying to build the first large language models around the transcriptomic cell atlases. Uh, so just from transcriptome, what are we able to build models on? Uh, and that's proving to be incredibly interesting. I mean, we're learning a ton about uh, evolutionary relationships. We're learning about uh, how you can predict perturbations due to infection, drugs, and such forth. Um, and uh, it's laying the groundwork for more models to be built on other big data sets around, for example, uh, the human protein atlas. And I mean, it's just really... Um, a very interesting uh, creative time in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let me end with, a, with a, sort of like a thought experiment, or I don't know. So the year is 2050. What does the doctor's appointment look like? <laughs> 2050? Yes. You know, I'm not sure you're seeing a human doctor at that point. Mm. Um, you know, it may be a full interaction with AI, um, and then the AI tells you what tests to go get or what follow-ups to do. Um, before you're actually interacting with the human doctor. Mm -hmm. And what about treatment, let's say in 2050? Is it all going to be personalized? It'll be highly personalized. And when you think about treatment modalities today, uh, it is mostly small molecule drugs or biologic drugs. Um, and I think in 2050, there'll be another category that will be equally represented, which is cellular therapies. I think we're in the infancy of how cells will be used as therapeutics, and that's just going to grow, and in the next couple of decades, going to find many, many applications. That's super fascinating. Professor Craig, thank you so much for... Thank you. For, it was wonderful to chat. Great.